Welcome to The Bard's Truth. This is your host, The Green Bard. Today we're going to talk about The Bond of Grey Wind and Rob, part two of my six-part series, The Dire Wolves of Winterfell. While it's not required, you may want to listen to part one of the series covering Lady and Sansa's Bond, available on this channel. I'll wait. It's available, as always, on my website, alivealivezero.home.blog. Part 3, Nymeria and Arya's story. Part 4, Summer and Bran's story. Part 5, Shaggy Dog and Rickon's story. And Part 6, Ghost and John's story are also available on the blog and will be coming to this podcast and channel. Dire Wolves in the Snow We revisit A Game of Thrones, Bran 1, to look at Rob's specific part in the story. In this glimpse, we see Rob as proud, lordly, commanding, and confident. This is a good first impression of his character. He also is a bit stubborn. As we move forward, we'll see how this is reflected in Grey Wind. By then, Jory, Jon, Theon Greyjoy had all dismounted as well. What in seven hells is it? Greyjoy was saying. A wolf, Rob told him. A freak, Greyjoy said. Look at the size of him. Here we'll skip ahead. It is a sign, Jory said. Father frowned. This is only a dead animal, Jory, he said, yet he seemed troubled. Snow crunched under his boots as he moved around the body. Do we know what killed her? There's something in the throat, Rob told him, proud to have found the answer before Father even asked. There, just under the jaw. His father knelt and groped under the beast's head with his hand. He gave a yank and held it up for all to see. A foot of shattered antler tine snapped off, all wet with blood. Bran tore his eyes away from the monster. That was when he noticed the bundle in Rob's arms. He gave a cry of delight and moved closer. The pup was a tiny ball of gray-black fur, its eyes still closed. It nuzzled blindly against Rob's chest as he cradled it, searching for milk among his leathers, making a sad little whimpery sound. Bran reached out hesitantly. Go on, Rob told him. You can touch him. Later, after John hands him Summer, The little thing squirmed against him, as if it heard and understood. No, Bran cried out fiercely, it's mine. Put away your sword, Greyjoy, Rob said. For a moment, he sounded as commanding as their father, like the lord he would someday be. We will keep these pups. You cannot do that, boy, said Harwin, who is Holland's son. Later. Rob resisted stubbornly. Sir Roderick's red bitch whelped again last week, he said. It was a small litter, only two live pups. She will have enough milk. She'll rip them apart when they try to nurse. Later. The direwolf graces the banners of House Stark, John pointed out. I am no Stark, father. Their lord father regarded John thoughtfully. Rob rushed into the silence he left. I will nurse him myself, father, he promised. I will soak a tile with warm milk and give him suck from that. Later. You must train them well, their father said. You must train them. The Kennelmaster will have nothing to do with these monsters, I promise you that. And the gods help you if you neglect them or brutalize them or train them badly. These are not dogs to beg for treats and slink off at a kick. A dire wolf will rip a man's arm off his shoulder as easily as a dog will kill a rat. Are you sure you want this? The pups may die anyway, despite all you do. They won't die, Rob said. We won't let them die. Keep them then. Jory? Desmond? Gather up all the pups. It's time we're back to Winterfell. So poor Rob, if he only knew that his premature death was foreshadowed in his very first scene. As to Grey Wind, we got our first glimpse of him in this scene as well, but there's not much to say of him here. He was helpless, but he grows to be a fearsome beast and a fierce friend. Grey Wind and Rob the Lord, A Game of Thrones. Grey Wind's story has many strong themes we can use to understand the war bond to Rob. We see him as Rob's constant affectionate companion when not with his pack or hunting and we see how they mirror each other's personalities. We see how fierce a protector he is, especially in battle or when Rob is threatened. We also see more evidence that Rob and Grey Wind are both leaders of their respective packs, though Grey Wind is extremely obedient to Rob. Their interactions can be broken down as follows. 1. Protecting or shadowing Rob, whether leading at his side or following at his heels. This happens 10 times. A sub-component of this is that he's threatening, growling, attacking, or otherwise instilling fear in others. This happens 6 times. 2. They mirror each other's feelings, thoughts, or actions. This happens four times. 3. Obeying. This happens four times. Number 4. Petting, scratching, or other affectionate behavior. Four times. 5. 
Howling, hunting, or other pack behavior also happens four times. This list can be considered to be a set of ongoing themes with our dire wolves, coupled with one more concept, that when the wolves are separated from their children, bad things can happen, though certainly not with every separation. As with Lady and Sansa, we also see this with Grey Wind and Rob and the other pairs. The Game of Thrones, John 2. Given that Rob has no POV, we get Grey Wind's story chiefly from Catelyn and Rob, though Arya and John give us glimpses from time to time. The most common theme in their bond is for Grey Wind to be shadowing slash protecting Rob, as in this next quote, where we also see Rob growing into his leadership role. Rob was in the middle of it, shouting commands with the best of them. He seemed to have grown of late, as if Bran's fall and his mother's collapse had somehow made him stronger. Grey Wind was at his side. A Game of Thrones, Catelyn 3. So the next interaction is for Grey Wind to be in the yard howling with Summer and Shaggy. Summer is worrying for Bran and the other two are howling in solidarity. Rob can tell their voices apart. The bond may be part of why he can do this, as he may even be hearing Grey Wind's voice in his mind. He also shows leadership here, even instructing his mother. Outside the tower, a wolf began to howl. Caitlin trembled, just for a second. Bran's. Rob opened the window and let the night air into the stuffy tower room. The howling grew louder. It was a cold and lonely sound, full of melancholy and despair. Don't, she told him. Bran needs to stay warm. He needs to hear them sing, Rob said. Somewhere out in Winterfell, a second wolf began to howl in chorus with the first. Then a third, closer. Shaggy and Grey Wind, Rob said, and their voices rose and fell together. You can tell them apart if you listen close. A Game of Thrones, Bran 4. So in this chapter, we see Rob's leadership reflected in Grey Wind, who is hurting slash protecting Rickon along with his brothers. We also learn that he is bigger than Summer, at least. He's probably bigger than Shaggy, too, given how he dominates him later. Bran watched from his window seat. Wherever the boy went, Grey Wind was there first, loping ahead to cut him off until Rickon saw him, screamed in delight, and went pelting off in another direction. Shaggy ran at his heels, spinning and snapping if the other wolves came too close. In the heart of the chapter, we see all three act as a pack again in their threatening of Tyrion. One observation, they surrounded Tyrion, but Grey Wind is not leading this particular action. Summer is. Yet Grey Wind is the most aggressive in this scene, actually tearing at the imp's sleeve. At the end, notice how Grey Wind obeys Rob on command. He's well disciplined. Prior to the command, though, Grey Wind seems to reflect both Summer and Rob's moods and the boy's antipathy toward Tyrion. The door to the yard flew open. Sunlight came streaming across the hall as Rickon burst in, breathless. The dire wolves were with him. The boy stopped by the door, wide-eyed. But the wolves came on. Their eyes found Lannister. Or perhaps they caught his scent. Summer began to growl first. Grey Wind picked it up. They padded toward the little man, one from the right and one from the left. Perhaps it's time I took my leave, Tyrion said. He took a step backward, and Shaggy Dog came out of the shadows behind him, snarling. Lannister recoiled, and Summer lunged at him from the other side. He reeled away, unsteady on his feet, and Grey Wind snapped at his arm, teeth ripping at his sleeve and tearing a loose scrap of cloth. No, Bran shouted from the high seat as Lannister's men reached for their steel. Summer, here! Summer, to me! The dire wolf heard his voice, glanced at Bran and again at Lannister. He crept backward, away from the little man, and settled down below Bran's dangling feet. Rob had been holding his breath. He let it out with a sigh and called, Grey Wind! His dire wolf moved to him, swift and silent. Now there was only Shaggy Dog, rumbling at the small man, eyes burning like green fire. Rickon, call him, Bran shouted at his baby brother. And Rickon remembered himself and screamed, Home, Shaggy! Home now! The black wolf gave Lannister one final snarl and bounded off to Rickon, who hugged him tightly around the neck. Later that chapter, we see two more interactions with the pack where Grey Wind is leading slash protecting or dominating the other wolves. He seems back to his natural role, leader of the pack. Summer snatched table scraps from Bran's hand while Grey Wind and Shaggy fought over a bone in the corner. Winterfell's dogs would not come near the hall now. Bran had found that strange at first, but he was growing used to it. Later. That night, after the plates had been cleared, Rob carried Bran up to a bed himself. Grey Wind led the way. Summer close behind. His brother was strong for his age, and Bran was light as a bundle of rags. But the stairs were steep and dark, and Rob was breathing hard by the time they reached the top. 
I do wonder if Rob is crying here. A Game of Thrones brand five. The next interaction is when they go riding outside of Winterfell. The passage is quite rich. First, the pups are shadowing the boys, but then they go off hunting. Rob discusses the wolves intuition, or ESP, I guess you might call it. I think it's clear that they can sense danger or malice in men. Is this a telepathic trait, part of their magic, or just a general wolf trait, part of their sense of smell? It may be another indication of Grey Wind feeling and reflecting Rob's growing unease with the tensions in the South at court. I must point out that there is a bit of a weakness in the instinctual danger sense in this scene. The dire wolves ought to have sensed and smelled Stiv and his band from a mile away, yet instead they brought down the elk. Perhaps the instinct to hunt overpowered the protective instinct. Are we supposed to worry about this issue later in the story? Either way, it definitely fits with the theme that when the wolves are separated from their children, bad things happen. They passed beneath the gatehouse, over the drawbridge, through the outer walls. Summer and Greywing came loping beside them, sniffing at the wind. Close behind them came Theon Greyjoy, with his longbow and a quiver of broadheads. He had a mind to take a deer, he'd told them. He was followed by four guardsmen in mailed shirt and coifs, and Joseph, a stick-thin stableman whom Rob had named Master of Horse while Holland was away. Maester Lewin brought up the rear, riding a donkey. Later. Grey Wind was restless too, Rob said. His auburn hair had grown shaggy and unkempt, and a reddish stubble covered his jaw, making him look older than his fifteen years. Sometimes I think they know things, sense things, Rob sighed. I never know how much to tell you, Bran. I wish you were older. What follows is the attack. Once they return with Rob, Grey Wind and Summer both attack the wildlings slash deserters savagely quickly taking down all but Stiv. Grey Wind covers a ton of ground, living up to his name. Rob whistled. They heard a faint sound of soft feet on wet leaves. The undergrowth parted, low-hanging branches giving up their accumulation of snow, and Grey Wind and Summer emerged from the green. Summer sniffed the air and growled. Later. Rob shouted, Winterfell, and kicked his horse. The gelding plunged down the bank as the ragged men closed. A man with an axe rushed in, shouting and heedless. Rob's sword caught him full in the face with a sickening crunch and a spray of bright blood. The man with a gaunt, stubbly face made a grab for the reins, and for a half second he had them, and then Grey Wind was on him, bearing him down. He fell back into the stream with a splash and a shout, flailing wildly with his knife as his head went under. The dire wolf plunged in after him, and the white water turned red where they had vanished. Later, the sixth man ran from the carnage, but not far. As he went scrambling up to the far side of the bank, Grey Wind emerged from the stream, dripping wet. He shook the water off and bounded after the running man, hamstringing him with a single snap of his teeth and going for the throat as the screaming man slid down toward the water. When Stiv threatens Bran, Grey Wind again immediately obeys Rob's command to stand down, but Summer is having none of it. He is intent on Bran, who is being threatened by Stiv. Both boys, for their part, never consider following Stiv's order to kill the wolves. They know the wolves make them safer. Rob does a good job of delaying as best he can in hope of help. In that moment, Bran saw everything. Summer was savaging Holly, pulling glistening blue snakes from her belly. Her eyes were wide and staring. Bran could not tell whether she was alive or dead. The gray stubbly man and the one with the axe lay unmoving, but Osha was on her knees, crawling toward her fallen spear. Grey wind padded toward her, dripping wet. Call him off, the big man shouted. Call them both off, or the cripple boy dies now. Grey Wind, Summer, to me, Rob said. The dire wolves stopped, turned their heads. Grey Wind loped back to Rob. Summer stayed where he was, his eyes on Bran and the man beside him. He growled. His muzzle was wet and red, but his eyes burned. Asha used the butt end of her spear to lever herself back to her feet. Blood leaked from a wound on the upper arm where Rob had cut her. Bran could see sweat trickling down the big man's face. Stiv was as scared as he was, he realized. Starks, the man muttered. Bloody Starks, he raised his voice. Osha, kill the wolves and get his sword. Kill them yourself, she replied. I'll not be getting near those monsters. Later. Rob hesitated a moment, then slowly and deliberately he dismounted and stood with his sword in hand. Now, kill the wolves, Rob did not move. You do it, the wolves or the boy. No, Bran screamed. If Rob did as they asked, Stiv would kill them both anyway, once the dire wolves were dead. Note also the fear their attacks instill in Asha. The fear the wolves instill in others will be an ongoing theme in this series. 
A Game of Thrones, Brand 6. The next chapter is our last with Grey Wind, Summer, and Shaggy Dog together, and there are several interactions with the wolves. Our first scene shows Grey Wind dominating Shaggy in cooperation with Rob. The teamwork they show seems a reflection that their bond is getting strong. Rickon had slashed at them with a rusty iron sword he'd snatched from a dead king's hand, and Shaggy Dog had come slavering out of the darkness like a green-eyed demon. The wolf was near as wild as Rickon. He'd bitten Gage on the arm and torn a chunk of flesh from Micken's thigh. It had taken Rob himself and Grey Wind to bring him to bay. Arlen had the black wolf chained up in the kennels now, and Rickon cried all the more for being without him. Next is the renowned scene with the Great John, where Grey Wind, at a word from Rob, attacks the Umber Man, which proves Rob's bona fides to the crowd of lords. Rob's bond to Grey Wind shows a high level of cooperation here. Grey Wind knows exactly what to do and takes his cue from Rob. His savagery is also swift and permanent. Rob is not to be effed with. And when Lord Umber, who was called the Great John by his men and stood as tall as Hodor and twice as wide, threatened to take his forces home if he was placed behind the Hornwoods or the Sirwins in the Order of March, Rob told him he was welcome to do so. And when we are done with the Lannisters, he promised, scratching Grey Wind behind the ear, we will march back north, root you out of your keep, and hang you for an oathbreaker. Cursing, the Great John flung a flagon of ale into the fire and bellowed that Rob was so green he must piss grass. When Hallis Mullen moved to restrain him, he knocked him to the floor, kicked over a table, and unsheathed the biggest, ugliest great sword that Bran had ever seen. All along the benches, his sons and brothers and sworn swords leapt to their feet, grabbing for their steel. Yet Rob only said a quiet word, and in a snarl and the blink of an eye, Lord Umber was on his back, his sword spinning on the floor three feet away, and his hand dripping blood where Grey Wind had bitten off two fingers. My Lord Father taught me that it was death to bear steel against your liege lord, Rob said, but doubtless you only meant to cut my meat. Bran's bowels went to water as the great John struggled to rise, sucking at the red stumps of fingers. But then, astonishingly, the huge man laughed. Your meat, he roared, is bloody tough. I love that. It must be mentioned that the great John likely recognizes Rob as a warg in this scene. We wonder about the other lords' reactions when word of the encounter reaches them. Some may fear him, but many, like the great John, doubtless respect him and want to follow him. We must wonder what Roos Bolton thought. Did the seed of betrayal begin to sprout even this early? We next get the scene with the dire wolves' reaction to the return of Lady's Bones. We won't cover that scene again, but it is a great reminder of how tightly the pack is bonded. They seem to sense her coming a long way off. Was it just her scent, or had they already known she was coming? Had they felt it telepathically when she died? They even seem to howl in unison, feeling their sister's approach together. Something piques their senses at the return of their sister. They are linked to each other, not just to their children. They know that their sister is coming home, and they lament it. Finally, we get Bran's reaction when Rob and Grey Wind leave Winterfell for the last time. These two interactions continue the theme of how Grey Wind shadows Rob. Grey Wind's speed and lithe figure are also highlighted. He wheeled the courser around and trotted away. Grey Wind followed, loping beside the warhorse, lean and swift. Hallis Mullen went before them through the gate, carrying the rippling white banner of House Stark atop a high standard of grey ash. Theon Greyjoy and the Great John fell in on either side of Rob, and their knights formed up in a double column behind them, steel-tipped lances glinting in the sun. Later. Beneath the castle walls, a roar of sound went up. The foot soldiers and townsfolk were cheering Rob as he rode past, brand new cheering for Lord Stark, the Lord of Winterfell, on his great stallion with his cloak streaming and Grey Wind racing beside him. That concludes The Dire Wolves of Winterfell, Episode 2.1. Come back for Episode 2.2, starting when Grey Wind and Rob are reunited with Catelyn. If you enjoy this content, you can also consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks to all the terrific artists who let me use their work on this YouTube video.